Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Janne Verrijken. I'm an entrepreneur from Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And today I am going to be your moderator. And I'm really excited about this because we have two amazing guests. Our first guest is Constantijn von Oranje. He is the special envoy at techleap.nl. Techleap.nl is a publicly funded non-profit organization that is helping to quantify and accelerate the Dutch tech ecosystem by empowering people and their companies to scale. Welcome, Constantijn. Hi, good to be there. Hi, <laughs> there are you. Let me see if we can... There you are. Welcome, Constantijn. Yes. Hi. Hi. Our second guest is uh, Mr. Christos Dimas from Greece. And he is a very young and passionate deputy minister of development and investment. His portfolio is innovation, technology, and research. Welcome, Mr. Dimas. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. It's really great having you here. We are going to have a conversation about innovation in both the Netherlands and Greece. And these are two different countries. But our guests, they have the same mission, which is to, to really accelerate the tech ecosystems of their countries. And this is the first fully digital uh, edition of the campus party. And I am currently staying at a holiday residence at Schiermonnik Oog, which is a tiny island in the Netherlands. And I have a, a sea view now. I see the ocean, the beach, the dunes, and even some kite surfers. And you, as the viewers, are watching my, where is it, really messy apartment. <laughs> and I'm really curious, Constantine, um, where are you calling from? Can you show us some, something of your room? Well, I think what you see is what you get, but it's, uh, it's actually the former room of my daughter, which, we, which has been my corona hideout for the last few uh, months. Okay, very nice. And what about you, Christos? Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm in Athens. I'm in uh, I'm in my office. So uh, a boring answer, but <laughs> <laughs> you're not working Athens. remotely. Sorry, you are not working remotely. Not at the moment, but we we have been working remotely in, in the last several months. Yeah, and now back at the office. Really nice, actually. Okay, so my real question is to you, uh, Constantijn. Um, the Netherlands is actually number four of the Global Innovation Index. So actually, we are doing pretty well at innovation. Uh, why is it so important to, to help startups and scale-ups and to accelerate this tech ecosystem? Yeah, so innovation is not the same as, uh, as kind of the whole tech development. I think um, um, many of the indicators will be around science, around connectivity and those and kind of basic infrastructure uh is also quality of uh, public institution and those kind of things um the tech and startup uh ecosystem are important because they drive innovation forward they build new companies and so it's not just innovation in existing companies which is usually more incremental uh, we're really looking at uh, supporting more disruptive uh, innovation more market creating innovation and, and ensuring that we have the right uh, kind of infrastructure for the ideas and technologies that come out of universities to uh, to you know to develop into uh, real companies, and then to make sure that they don't stay local, but that they actually go global. Yeah. So, uh, but you are fully committed to this goal of accelerating this tech ecosystem. What are the challenges in the Netherlands? Um, I guess one of the challenges is that we are um, we are overly organized and uh, and everything is organized for the for for the current and the past and if you and now with all of the technologies um, becoming uh, mature uh, we're seeing a, kind of an acceleration of, uh, of of new developments and uh, and so if you are very well organized um, and if people are very kind of confident you know there's not that kind of burning platform or urge. To, to do things, uh, to do new things, new things, do things differently. So it's really creating that kind of urge uh, that entrepreneurs actually take the opportunities that are there. It's also another kind of challenge is always going to be money um, or for most of the ecosystem. So getting investors in and getting our institutional investors to uh, to um, to see that uh, this asset class of venture capital is an interesting uh, proposition for them. So. Uh, 
for us, it's just uh, many places where we want to kind of uh, pull the levers and make sure that we accelerate this ecosystem. Yeah, and how do you actually do that? Well, in many ways, sometimes it's the government has a big role to play, uh, where there's market failures. Other places, it's the universities to make sure that they don't want to retain all their IP and that, they, uh, that they're much more innovation friendly or more entrepreneur friendly. Uh, sometimes it's also about role models because people need to see it's possible. You know, very long we've been saying in Europe it's not possible to build, build uh, big tech companies and it's just not true. Uh, we had Booking.com and Booking.com is an is a, uh, early 2000 uh, company. And, um, and, and of course, yeah, they didn't get the capital here and they were sold um, to a U.S. firm. But now it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really big, uh, big consumer facing company. And it's, uh, uh, so it's possible. And we've seen it from Spotify. We've seen it from ADN. We're seeing actually all across the continent, but everywhere in the world, actually, of places where you didn't expect it previously, that companies come up if they're the right ingredients and the right entrepreneurs. Yeah. yeah, and your strategy is working. You know, you're making progress, so that's very good. To, well, the to benchmarks see the results. we are, yeah. um, and uh, and I think there's a general the the, the vibe is good, and I think mm -hmm. the the general feeling is that uh, there's now quite a, a resilient uh, ecosystem, uh, more than in the last crisis. So actually, we're seeing that it's it's rebounding faster and and more creatively. Okay, let's get back to that one uh, after this. So, Christos, uh, my question to you. Um, one year ago, you have been handed the challenging portfolio uh, of, of research, technology and innovation. And that is a sector that traditionally lagged in Greece for decades. And, um, uh, but you have a big ambition. You want to be playing a leading role in, uh, in the innovation field within the Balkan neighborhood. Uh, why is that so important to you? Look, Jan, first of all, um, we are... Uh, underperforming according to our potential. So mm -hmm. if you see uh, how many publications Greek scientists have in, in uh, top journals uh, worldwide in all, all of the sectors, you will see that in terms of percentage, according to our population, we are very high. But when you see uh, how many of them actually turn their scientific ideas into an entrepreneurial idea, then yes, we, we lag behind uh, significantly. Um, one of our main goals uh, in this government is uh, to fuel up the, the Greek ecosystem and uh, this can not only happen with uh, money coming from, uh, from the public budget, mm -hmm. uh, so we're giving uh, real financial incentives to the private sector to invest more in, in R&D, so for example we're, we're tripling the super deductions, tax, tax deductions for companies that invest in R&D uh, so we believe this will have a great impact. Actually, it will help uh, increase investment in, in R&D by more than 300 million in the following two and three years. We're giving incentives to business angels to invest in, in the Greek startup ecosystem. We're creating an innovation district in, uh, in Athens uh, where we hope to, to turn it into the physical ground of innovation uh, of, uh, of Greece. And we're also creating a, a digital platform, uh, Elevate Greece, which will be on, on air uh, within the next month, uh, where everybody can actually take a peek of the Greek ecosystem from their computer and uh, uh, help uh, uh, start uppers or even spin offs and spin outs uh, communicate uh, between them uh, or even uh, try to attract funding. So we, we have a, a, a very optimistic agenda, uh, which we are running very quickly. And we hope that within the next years, we will be improving a lot of our, our score in the Global Innovation Index. Okay, wow, it sounds really promising indeed, uh, what you're telling me. Um, Constantine, if I get back to this resilience of these uh, startups, uh, well, the Corona crisis, uh, COVID-19 is a major threat to all types of businesses. But uh, what is, how are the Dutch startups and scale-ups affected by this crisis? Yeah, I think we're similar to many others. We saw the, the kind of the, also the genome benchmark and basically 45 or 40% 40 has, uh, has a runway of, uh, of only a few months. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, I think that's, that is a weakness in most European countries is that the, the, the total um, invested 
um, uh, amounts are lower than in many other places and um, or than in the in kind of the leading mm -hmm. ecosystems which means that you just have much less money to go uh, to go by so uh, you need to cut deep and um, and and make sure that you you extend your runway uh, mm -hmm. and we've seen but we've seen um, seen a few categories of companies is um, a few of them are kind of of hit really badly in a sector like in events or tourism you know and yeah. uh, and they don't have very resilient managers so they basically try to sit down and try to get government subsidies and then and hope to survive um, we the, the subsidy program has been um, kind of or designed in a way that you have to um, have the potential to uh, to emerge out of this crisis again and be able to repay the loan and it's not so much because of repayment because you can actually also convert it into stock but the idea is that uh, mm -hmm. we really we can't give the the scarce resources that are there to companies that are uh, maybe not viable. And I think um, this is different than than uh, the SMEs. Uh, is that startups are a vehicle for a very risky endeavor, and that that uh, failure is more part of uh, or failure. I don't say failure, but if you basically uh, yeah. bankruptcy is more is more akin to this set, this kind of companies. So yeah. that's one. Then you have the ones that are in a in a in a problematic industry, but they pivot and they do remarkable things. I mean, they really show what startups are uh, under very harsh circumstances. Uh, come up with a new idea, reconnect with your customers, and and develop new services and remarkable. And then you have a few that are smack on uh, on trend. I mean, they are either in healthcare or they're doing remote learning or they're doing food delivery, and you know they're going like mad. And and for them, it's important. That they get enough investment, and uh, and then you see that the investment system is kind of slowly kind of, kind of slowing down because they are um, uh, investing in their portfolio companies and they're not actually um, um, doing much investment outside of their uh, portfolio. And yeah. uh, so for those companies, really the issue is how do we get fresh money in? And there, I think the government has a role, and, and Europe as well through the EIF, and um, can actually capitalize the venture capital system. Uh, to allow these companies to really accelerate. No, exactly. So support them in every way you can uh, on that. Yeah. And uh, Christos, how is uh, how are things in in Greece? How is the innovation and tech scene uh, under these Corona circumstances? I think what Constantine described practically uh, is a, is a good description of uh, not only the Netherlands but of uh, ecosystems and uh, companies all over Europe at least. What I want to say is that when, when you're implementing a business plan, predictability is extremely important. In this case, we had a, a, an unpredictable event and an unpredictable event that practically influenced everything. So especially for startups, which uh, do not have the necessary economic resources uh, to, to go outside their business plan for two or three months, uh, you understand that it is catastrophic. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, there are some specific sectors and some startups that were able to, to take advantage of, uh, of these problems and come up with uh, innovative ideas. So uh, we did have uh, several hackathons in, in Greece. There was also mm -hmm. one uh, organized by the European Commission where one of the Greek teams uh, was awarded the first place uh, award, um, where you see that uh, in difficult difficult cases like the one that we're dealing at the moment with uh, coronavirus, uh, there are innovative solutions um, which uh, scientists or young entrepreneurs can, can come up with in order to help solve the problems of, of our everyday life or the way we work. So it, it is important to, to see that uh, startups that uh, have a, a bigger part of, a, of risk in their business plan should, should be uh, should be uh, assisted, whether that includes financial tools or uh, tax uh, incentives, in order to give them the opportunity to to stand uh, uh, over the the crisis. Yeah, exactly. And on the other hand, you see that a lot of startups are making a con contribution in fighting this crisis. So they're helpful as well uh, this way. Um, one of the biggest challenge uh, for startups and scale ups is the recruitment of tech talent. And there's actually a global war of talent. Um, Christos, uh, Greece has been facing a brain drain for some years now. Um, you, how are you as a deputy minister dealing with that? So one, one of our challenges that we're facing is that uh, 
we have a lot of talent in Greece. And uh, if you see most of the uh, innovation districts or incubator centers, accelerators all around the world, including the Netherlands, it's uh, quite possible that you will find a, a Greek entrepreneur uh, inside there. So it is extremely important for us to, to try to see how we can reattract some of our talented individuals that, especially during the years of crisis, left the country. One of the reasons why we have uh, invested so much in such an optimistic agenda in Greece is exactly that. We want our talent, first of all, uh, to have the ability to think of uh, being capable that they can meet their goals uh, within the country and also start reattracting some of uh, uh, the young entrepreneurs and scientists that left the country. That's why we're giving more incentives to companies to invest in R&D in, in, in Greece. We're creating the innovation district, as I said before. But also we would want to see because you, you said in the beginning that you're speaking from a, from a summer house and you have a sea view. So yeah. uh, practically Greece is a country that, uh, as you all know, uh, has amazing sea views. So attracting digital nomads is one of our next future steps, uh, especially now that we dealt uh, very successfully with the coronavirus uh, in, in Greece. Uh, we would like to see more and more talented people that have the capability of not working with physical presence, working from, uh, from a cafe in, in uh, somewhere uh, in, in the Greek seaside or from a library in a, in a Greek island. Uh, so uh, trying, trying to be very competitive in attracting talent in, in all fields and first of all, keeping our talent uh, within the country is one of our priorities. So my next trip should be to Greece. Definitely. Okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> okay, thank you. You, 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 have, you have an invitation, so uh, you are more than welcome to, to come to Greece. Oh, yeah, okay, be, be careful, be that. careful. <laughs> Constantine, you have the invitation as well, obviously. Thank you. Uh, we can't compete with that. <laughs> the, Actually, we're happy it's raining here now for the first time. In, uh, we, have some, it, we had uh, about three months of drought, which are this climate is a bit odd. So we were trying to copy your policies. So we tried to bring a lot of sun in here and, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, We're not well, that good at it. Talking about climate change, that brings me to the next topic, actually, because crisis, um, it, it doesn't only poses a threat, but there are also opportunities, always. And um, we all know that we have to transform our economies. They, uh, the next economy is going to be sustainable, circular, digital and inclusive. And uh, startups and scale-ups, they play an important role in these transitions. But, um, and with every crisis, we have hope. Okay, uh, now we're going to do stuff better. You know, we've learned from this. Uh, for example, now during the corona crisis, we started to work remotely. Schooling was done online and digital. Um, and also this crisis exposed really the weaknesses of our systems. For example, the inequality. You know, some groups are hit harder than other ones. And the interdependencies in our production chains are exposed, all that kind of stuff. So people are now really hopeful. Okay, let's fix it. Let's make the world better, create a better future. That's also, you know, one of the themes of this conference. But my question to you is... How can we sustain this momentum for change? How can we make sure that we really use this crisis to accelerate some of these transitions instead of going back to normal? Maybe Christos, or you have an opinion on that? Yeah, uh, first of all, we have to learn the lesson. So uh, dealing, dealing with a, a pandemic crisis is extremely important. It's something that we should not underestimate. And that has to do both regarding public policy, public administration, but also all of us as, uh, as individuals regarding uh, individual responsibility and collective responsibility. So we, we have, it's, it's extremely important to be better informed uh, and this is a role that public administration has to play as well because one, one of uh, the most important factors of success in the Greek case is the fact that we quickly informed uh, the Greek society about the pandemic crisis what it happens and we took measures quite early. So um, we, we, we need to listen to the scientists uh, when dealing with such issues. 
uh, it's important to be able to express our personal opinion, but I think at least uh, hearing what scientists have to say is extremely important. And that does not, that does not only have to do with, with the pandemic crisis, but you, you mentioned correctly with, with climate change, for example. So in, in, in this case, with the, with the climate crisis, we have to listen to the scientists as well. It's extremely important that, that all measures that public administration uh, does uh, uh, implement uh, are in line with the, what the scientists believe. Uh, so I, if, if I had to choose one lesson uh, regarding the, the, the pandemic crisis would be that it's extremely important to hear the experts, to hear the scientists on issues uh, where they have a, a, a more spherical knowledge uh, on the issue. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to add to that okay. that is um, that I would mm -hmm. agree. Um, it, it the crisis put science back into uh, back into an important place, um, but it still requires politicians and and government people to uh, to to communicate that into a strategy which um, combines all the other interests. We've seen that now uh, with uh, first uh, the epidemiologists were released and the virologists were really in charge and 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 but with opening up the economy you you need different disciplines and and um, so um, I think your question about how you retain this momentum is a really a pertinent one um, and I think some of some it is all about behavior right so um, how deep has this has this impacted us that we start changing our behavior and um, so i think some companies are are likely not to do all the business travel that they did before because they've seen that many of the meetings you can actually do by zoom calls so i think business travel will, will change i think um, for my office uh, we don't really want to be in a traffic jam at uh, at nine o'clock in the morning so why we i think we will retain our um, our zoom calls or um, we don't do, use zoom but yeah whatever <laughs> alternative something um <laughs> And, um, and 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 there is some real behavioral change. Um, um, it depends really where this crisis is going. So if you have another, um, if we have another wave, or if you have another pandemic, or if the climate, um, the climate change, which is really um, a, a much even a much more profound um, uh, crisis, if it starts to hurt and we have to, and it 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 uh, it really forces us to change our behavior, then then things might change. Uh, but for many things, um, people are urging uh, to go back um, to past behavior. And I think it's really up to everyone, the government, but also companies, um, to now take this opportunity and really make that commitment to change and make it uh, irreversible. Uh, and, and, and especially when it comes to our mobility, our kind of our... Um, these kind of patterns where we know that it's that has been it is wrong you know and we know that certain things in our economy have not been right and we're waste a lot of we're producing a lot of waste and um and uh but it requires guts you know when there's no uh, burning platform when there's no crisis uh it becomes much much harder to convince people to change their behavior so uh it's up to all of us to uh, to make that uh, change possible Exactly. I'm happy to hear you saying that. I completely agree. And uh, Constantine, is there also something that you personally learned from this crisis? Um, could be business-wise, it could be personal, but some lessons. You know, our lives completely changed the last couple of months. Um, well, hygiene is one thing. I mean, <laughs> you start getting concerned about every doorknob you touch and, uh, and, and you know, and I'm and uh, you know we have someone that we are taking care of who is kind of physically weak so we will be very careful um because we didn't want uh her to be affected um and it means it's a, it's a completely different way of life but that's a, that's a side step i think the what i really thought was amazing was um the 12th of march we had our um the first press conference saying that you know we were going into kind of a, um, a semi lockdown <laughs> And uh, we had our meeting, uh, we had actually an office meeting with the team and we were looking at our objectives for the next quarter and uh, we're setting our, our OKRs, we call them. And um, uh, we said we have to coronify this plan um, because this this world is going to change. And uh, and then we were still kind of uh, thinking, you know, the main, our main strategy is still going ahead. And then 
on the next day on Friday, we said, okay, we're gonna, gonna go full out uh, Corona. And uh, we, we uh, issued a survey, we surveyed startups. The next week we knew about what the um, economic um, um, damage was going to be, what their financial needs were. So it gave us a, um, a, a, the data and a platform to negotiate with the government to, uh, to, to start and develop a support plan for, for startups. And the speed with which our team, uh, the team uh, switched, um, we've hired about 25% uh, of our team in the in time of Corona. So we didn't even we didn't see um, our our new colleagues, and they and they just just stepped in and 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 started working, which does really tell you something about what is possible nowadays. You know, you can actually run remote teams. You can uh, if you've got a strong purpose and, and focus. Uh, and it, the motivation stayed high. We did surveys, you know, of people's um, attitude. Um, we also made sure that people that were alone in their houses, that they got kind of uh, made sure that they got the attention that they needed. And uh, um, it's possible. It's not desirable. I don't think uh, we want to stay and work like this all the time. But it does show what is possible and, uh, and how much more productive you can be and efficient. And uh, so that was a big learning. Yeah, it's a beautiful learning uh, anyway. Uh, well, the the theme of this uh, this conference, this edition, is rebooting the world. Uh, that's a big thing. It's a major thing. But um, if I gave you a magical button that would allow you to restart something specific tomorrow, what would it be, Christos? Without any doubt, climate change. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we have to be much more careful on that issue. We uh, I, I don't think that globally we have understood the impact of uh, of the climate crisis at the moment. We we've got world le leaders who actually do not accept uh, the the presence of uh, of, uh, of climate change. And if you see the 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 rising temperature in the last years, it's it's extremely uh, concerning. Uh, one, one of the reasons that the uh, European Union uh, Council of Ministers has actually said that 30% of the funds of the new horizon, uh, Horizon Europe, uh, will go towards climate change is exactly this. Because we want our scientists and our young entrepreneurs to find innovative solutions uh, about real world problems uh, dealing with, uh, with climate change. So if I had this uh, magical button, I would definitely press it uh, to reboot the, the climate. I understand. I completely understand. Constantine, what well, would you Crystal's do? Well, already pressed his button, so I don't, okay. have, to press, I don't <laughs> have to press the climate button. No. Uh, then mine would be education, mm -hmm. I think. Um, we've now seen what the potential is, and we, we've been talking about uh, reforms in education for... I think as long as education exists, but uh, we also know that the skills required now are not matched by the education system. And um, and uh, it's just not fair towards the people uh, for our young, the young generations and not give them the opportunities that are exist that are existing. So the content is there. It's really, um, and, and the, the, the theory about education is there and, and the need, the big demand in the market is there. So we basically know what is needed, but um, all kind of the vested interest of the education system is holding holding us back to make those changes. And um, um, so if I have a magic wand, I would uh, allow, you would just basically, um, how would you say that? Um, uh, re remove the legacy uh, to allow everybody to focus on what is really necessary, but to start with the interest of the kids and uh, and uh, ensure that every kid uh, is, is enabled to um, to really exploit their talents and uh, and to be uh, to be put in a position that they can uh, find a decent decent job um, in, uh, in in the world when they uh, when they exit the education system yes beautiful beautiful uh, backstage team we are actually now accepting uh, questions from the viewers do we have some? Let's wait. We're waiting that. Okay, they're coming. They are on their way. Um, well, this conference, um, uh, the campus party, is about creativity and innovation and using technology, you know, to create a better future. But creativity and innovation. I was wondering, um, where do you get your inspiration from, Christos? Uh, 
practically from my family. I have two two little kids, uh, and uh, obviously my wife. Uh, so my daughter is uh, almost seven years old. My son is four. Uh, when seeing the the next generation being so much smarter and uh, so much more adaptive to to new technology, I think it's it's more than inspiring. Uh, so I would I would dare to say. Uh, having conversations with them about, um, especially with my with my daughter who's uh, older, about what she wants to do in the future, how how they see things. Kids always see things differently. Uh, it's it's the, and I do try to spend most of my my free time with my children. Uh, so if I had to say where my inspiration comes, it's it's uh, definitely from from my children. Nice, thank you. What about you, Constantine? How do you get inspired? Um, oh, I get inspired when I see um, um, potential, unused potential, and um, and there's so much around. You know, um, when I was when I was working at the European Commission as well, we we you know there was you very often you know what what can be done or should be done, and it's just not happening, and that kind of drives this urge that I would say I want to I want to change things, I want to take away barriers. I said, well, why is that not happening? And yeah. sometimes it's a it's a thousand little things that doesn't that make something that does not happen. Um, so the art really is how to how to to release the energy so that the changes actually do, do come. And um, so yeah, it's 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 and that's actually also what I'm what I'm doing in the Netherlands. You know, we are yeah we are the maybe the fourth innovation country and now we are the third uh, startup ecosystem in Europe. Um, uh, that doesn't say very much, you know. It, you just go to you, you ask an individual entrepreneur how how um, how they're doing, and they're still finding that they're hitting a lot of barriers, and they're finding it difficult to, to attract talent. Uh, the whole quest for for funding is uh, is is a nightmare, and uh, you know it takes very long. You get small amounts, and um, and and that kind of triggers me. You know, it's maybe it's a negative trigger because it kind of makes me angry. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, you see many opportunities. You see that things can be done differently, and that drives my, um, you know, that motivates me. This annoyance, basically. Partly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So the audience uh, that we're having. Ah, we have a question here. How do you see place making playing in this space? Who of you would like to respond, Constantine or Christos? Uh, maybe explain placemaking. Placemaking is like, like branding, maybe a city or a region or a country. Oh, um, I think I think it's it's extremely important. So uh, uh, it's it's completely different working, for example, from a, a stable, uh, democratic environment or in a company which respects equality, uh, uh, different uh, opinions, uh, or having a product which you know uh, has been produced uh, 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 under uh, procedures that respect human rights. Uh, so I think, I think uh, placemaking in, in all level fields is important uh, to, to a great extent. But mm -hmm. in terms of uh, of a consumer uh, or even a user or business that might be buying a product or a space, uh, I think there's still, to a large extent, ignorance uh, regarding uh, uh, many of the aspects that I, I previously uh, referred to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this question also refers to, you know, being an attractive city. Or region or country itself, you know, to attract maybe attract talent and investors and to build this ecosystem. Obviously, yeah. uh, if if you see the the um, there's a global survey about uh, which cities, not even countries, are the most attractive, and you have a lot of different uh, uh, criteria. Uh, so, if for example, you had the weather condition of Greece. Uh, and the innovation system of the Netherlands, I think you would have almost the, the ideal place for somebody to work. It sounds amazing. <laughs> it sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah I think um, the, sometimes we've gone a bit far in branding. 
I mean, there are also with all of the benchmarks. Um, um, if you then look what's behind, then um, the, you know behind the the ideal brand might not be the ideal um, ecosystem. I mean, if you we've slowly seen also what in Silicon Valley, for instance, the you know the house prices, the 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 the, the difficulty retain staff and all these things is actually. Um, made that more companies stay now stay or at least have their developers out of um, out of uh, San Francisco, um, and uh, and and but it's, it's I think for us it's a um, so Amsterdam is a, definitely a brand for uh, for the Netherlands and uh, where you're in Rotterdam and so you know you, but I think the to have a to have a city where people know they want to go and where they can tell their friends you know if you go to Let's say if you if if you say I'm going to go to to Boston or go to Tel Aviv, or you know people will say, oh right, you what do you do? What you know what is your challenge? But if you would say, you know, maybe going to I won't I won't mention city because I get all this you know, hate mail after that. But um, they say, oh why do you go there? You know you don't want that. You know because as you said, there is a war for talent. So you do want uh, you create mm -hmm. an attractive environment, and it has to kind of come with a certain feeling you know of, of a positive feeling which is linked to innovation and that you know that you're going to get more talent there and 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 so uh but then there are other things you know that are real you know it's your tax system it's the reliability of the government it's the availability of funding so we we focus much more on those bits uh mm -hmm. because the, the the branding yeah i mean it has many many aspects to it that we don't control and mm -hmm. uh, and we really think that in the long in the long run it's the uh, is the the real the real um, uh, factors that determine if companies want to stay there, if they can grow there, and uh, and we also don't stop companies. You know, for instance, Dutch companies decide that they need to grow and they need to leave the Netherlands. That's fine, you know, um, because if that's if that's what's good for their business, it's good for their business. They what we do want is that they at a certain point bring their knowledge back, or that they form part of a network that supports the next generation of entrepreneurs. So we do support that. So there has to be. A positive connotation, if that's if that's what what, what you could call branding, there has mm -hmm. to be something that um, uh, makes people enthusiastic to contribute to what we're building in the Netherlands. So I think that is important. Exactly, exactly. Do we have another question, backstage team? Let's see if something pops up right now. And otherwise, I will go to my final question, which is we have a very um, young audience, you know, it's full of millennials. Um, and they're probably all interested in tech, creativity and innovation. What advice would you give them? Constantin, can I start with you? Uh, um, don't don't you know follow your dreams don't be held back by a lot of people that will tell you it's not possible um but don't uh, mistake stubbornness for a wise business decision so there is a, a, a seek out uh, the people you want to be with um so don't go don't try to convince all the naysayers but seek out the people that are positive go to those places where they are and then but do find good advisors and uh, and be willing to pay for them as well because um, so many mistakes have been made that you don't have to make. And, and so this kind of stubbornness that gets you to become an entrepreneur um, will not always keep you um, in, into business. So you have to kind of be open as well to advice from yeah. others. Stubborn, but not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. Okay, uh, Christos, do you have any advice? Yes, I, I would say that um, we should not be afraid to, to take risks but at the same time, we should try to think of the consequences of our, of our actions and what would happen in case uh, something did not go according to, to plan or uh, how I could start building next steps when I have a successful first step. Uh, but um, especially when you're competing at a global stage, you, you have to, 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 to take risks and uh, Taking 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 risk uh, might might have positive results in in the end in in not not in most cases though uh, but in case somebody does not succeed in in his or her goals in the beginning you should always find the, the strength in order to try again uh, another initiative and uh, uh, of course another risk and 
you, I, I, I would say, contrary to what Constantine is, that you should be stubborn in, in your effort to try uh, to take the right initiative, but you should not be stubborn in, in trying to implement a specific in, initiative, which perhaps might not be a, a, a good idea. Uh, yeah. So we should, we should uh, take risks, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, evaluating uh, what the consequences are of our risk every day. Exactly. Yeah, fully agree. And I think that perseverance is the thing that uh, that you are both saying. You know, that's important for entrepreneurs. To uh, keep on how going. is that for you, Jan, as an entrepreneur? Yeah, it, it sounds really it's familiar. <laughs> well, I, I, my father always said, and now I have to speak in Dutch. <laughs> I cannot explain it anywhere else. He said, "You have to be eigenwijs, but not eigenstom," which means. Right. You have to be yes. smart, you know, stubborn, but not stupid, actually. It's it, kind of that. It sounds cooler you, in Dutch. <laughs> and you implemented it? Uh, yeah, I try to do it every day, you know, but Good. it's, I, I think my lesson, and it's it's something that uh, he always taught me is, you know, to think independently, you know, don't take anything for granted. And that's also really important for innovation, you know, always question things around you, things you hear, things you see, but but don't be close-minded, you know, be open to others and, and, and new information. And I think that's very important for entrepreneurship and innovation in general. Great. So I would like to conclude this uh, session. I would like to thank uh, our guests uh, for being here with us and sharing your thoughts, your experiences. And uh, I wish you good luck in uh, pursuing all the beautiful ambitions that you both have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.